gave Simon a couple of text options and he, he mentioned this particular text. And it's quite interesting, it's not, the, the overarching theme is not uh, unlike what we dealt with in Titus chapter 3. But what's interesting, of course, is that um, this particular theme, again, is, is uh, evident not only in the writings of Paul, but also in the writings of Peter. And uh, the concern is to have a vital Christian, Christian life. But what's interesting is that the way they're motivated is slightly different. Uh, and so I trust that this will be a, a blessing to you this morning. So if you have your Bibles, keep them open at the text that was read. Uh, I've been prayed for, so we're going to uh, commence. Uh, I think you'll agree with me that we are living in uh, challenging times, uh, times uh, of, of rapid change. We see change happening almost before our eyes. But it's important to, to recognize that the early church that we read about, for example, in the book of Acts, was, was planted in, in very challenging times, pre-Christian times, and um, pagan times, uh, not much different to modern post-Christian times that we live in. There's a lot of talk about spirituality today, but uh, that doesn't mean necessarily uh, pursuing Christian truth. The writers of the New Testament don't gloss over these many challenges, and of course you see that particularly in, in the letters of the New Testament, but confront these, these challenges head on. And we see this in Peter's letter, the second letter. Uh, it was a very challenging environment. Not only were this, was there this, this um, uh, paganism, that was so prevalent as well. But, but Peter, in this particular letter, and I'm, I'm quoting from Second Peter chapter 2, he, he mentions there the prospect of false teachers. In the Old Testament, he said there were false prophets. He says, but uh, days coming when you are going to have, uh, you're going to have uh, false teachers that will uh, infiltrate your midst. And I quote, they will secretly introduce destructive heresies. Secretly. Wolves in sheep's clothing. And so the threat is not only out there. The threat, my friends, is also inside the church. And they will promote depraved conduct. You see, they, they won't preach the gospel. Um, so Peter wants his Christian leaders to, readers to lead God-honoring lives that end well. I don't know about you. Uh, as you can see, I'm not a youngster anymore. Uh, in fact, I was chatting to a pastor friend yesterday who uh, was doing some teaching at the college in our Christian leadership program. He's roughly my age. We, um, you know, the the uh, the finish line is <laughs> is getting nearer and nearer. <laughs> for some of you youngsters, you can't see it. For us, <laughs> um, <laughs> I see some of you. But but you know, the the overarching question: We want to finish well, don't you? I want to hear those words, well done, good, and faithful. And you know, it's not guaranteed. It's not guaranteed. We hear all the time, don't we, of, of people that stumble along the way, that, that get sidetracked. And so, um, Peter wants his readers to finish well, no matter what stage they're at. And the key to fulfilling this, according to Second Peter, is very simple. The key to finishing well, he's saying, is to, to grow spiritually. That is the focus of our text this morning. It's significant that this particular letter ends on that same note. That note, it's almost like a catch-all phrase to this letter where he, he encouraging, encourages his Christian readers to grow in the grace and knowledge of Jesus Christ. Grow in grace and knowledge of Jesus Christ. Grow in your understanding. Cultivate that relationship. Grow in your understanding of God's grace. Grace that not only saves you, but grace that sanctifies you. Grow in your knowledge of Jesus Christ. And perhaps your response this morning is, well, that's easier said than done. But, but I want you to listen to this morning, because I think that, to the text, because I think there's real encouragement uh, in our text this morning. 
First of all, spiritual growth is enabled. Peter reminds his readers, I'm looking at verse 3 of our text, that God's divine power has provided us with everything we need for a godly life. God's divine power has given us everything we need to grow spiritually. What an enormous encouragement. Everything that we need. But of course it's important to note that there, this promise is only for those who truly know God. If you look for example at the way Peter uh, deals with this, he says if you look for example uh, at verse 3, he says his divine power has been given to us everything we need through our knowledge of him who called us by his own glory and goodness. This promise of divine power, this promise of everything we need, my friends, is only for those that truly know God. I wonder how you would describe what it means to be a Christian. Well, one of the ways Peter would define it is that a Christian is someone that, that truly knows God. I think, for example, of Jesus' high priestly prayer recorded in John chapter 17, verse 3, where Jesus says, This is eternal life, that you may know God and Jesus Christ whom He has sent. That's what it means to be saved. That's what it means to be a believer, is to come to truly know God, not just know about God, but have an intimate relationship with God. And that's why Peter says, and concludes his letter, that we would grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Saviour, Jesus Christ, who has called us through His own glory and goodness. You know, when you fall in love, perhaps you've been in love um, you know, uh, one of our, our graduating students is recently engaged and getting married and, you know, he just talked about the fact that he just wants to spend all his time with his fiance, wanting to get to know, looking forward in a few months' time to getting married. That's what it means to know someone not so. And when we think of the glory and the goodness of God, I think in that prayer of confession we talked about the unimaginable sacrifice that he made for us. We, we, we want to get to know him, we want to spend time with him because of his goodness and his mercy and his grace. So this promise, my friend, it's a glorious promise, but it's, it's only for those who know God. In 1 Peter, in, in verse 4 of our text, Peter points out that this divine power fulfills God's very great and precious promises. It's good to know, isn't it, that the fulfillment of God's promises ultimately are not dependent on you and I, but it's dependent and assured because God's divine power fulfills them. One, com one translation describes these promises as God's magnificent promises. It's not just God's promises, it's God's very great promises. It's not just God's great promises, it's God's very great promises. And my friends, there's some glorious promises in the, in the Word of God. I think it's so sad, isn't it, when we run after the things of this world, the promises of this world, the allurement of this world, which, my friends, it doesn't ultimately satisfy us. It doesn't last. And so what Peter is doing here is reminding us of some of these great and precious promises. And those promises include, verse 4, deliverance from, and I'm quoting, the corruption of the world caused by evil desires. That's one of God's great promises that we will escape this world, this evil world, this world filled with corruption caused by evil desires which in turn will enable believers to participate in the divine nature. That's the promise. 
God's divine power is going to ensure that that happens. Participation in the divine nature, you can, you can understand, I know there's some students here, there's been quite a bit of debate about what that means. But what it certainly doesn't mean, people of God, that we become divine. All right, we're never going to become gods. We are made in the image of God. Christ, on the other hand, was the very nature of God. Rather, I think in the context, as one commentator argues, this refers to the immortal life that we will share one day with God when we have fully escaped the corruption of this world. I believe it was uh, Pastor John MacArthur, some of you will be aware of his ministry, he's a man now, I think in his 80s, and he's, he's been a faithful uh, warrior of God for many decades now. And um, I believe it was him who said, you know, the, the one thing he's looking forward to most in glory one day is that we will be done with sin. You know, and a pastor like that, he's seen the ravages and the devastation that sin has brought and the misery and the corruption and the heartache. And so, my friends, here we have this promise that a day is coming when, when we are going to be delivered from these things. There will be no more evil, no more corruption. And we will share the very life of God for all eternity. Peter alludes to this promise later in his letter in 2 Peter chapter 3. He says, but in keeping with God's promise, there's that language, we are looking forward. Notice this, he's speaking as a believer. We're looking forward. What are we looking forward to? A new heaven and a new earth. Free from sin. Free from corruption, where righteousness dwells. You see, my friends, this present evil age, it's, it's characterized by corruption and evil desires. Our brother this morning who led us in, in, in confession mentioned that. There's that the struggle within. But God, is, God has promised us a new heaven and a new earth where righteousness dwells. And the good news, according to Peter, is that God has provided us all with the power we need to prepare us for this heavenly destination. Given the reality of this provision, this divine power, God clearly wants you to live a godly life. Given the sufficiency of this provision that He's given you everything you need, Coupled with God's very great and precious promises, my friends, that should motivate you, according to verse 5 of our text, to make every effort to grow spiritually. As we think about these things, we are motivated. Peter's point isn't so much that spiritual growth requires great effort but rather given the extent of God's provision of divine power and the magnificence of His promises, this endeavor warrants great effort. It's worth expending energy given God's provision and God's promises. Well, Peter goes on to define what the spiritual growth looks like. He not only provides the power and the promises, but also the program, or as one writer says, the pathway to follow. Because, my friends, this process of spiritual growth is not an arbitrary thing. Not something subjective. So Peter spells out the process in verses 5 to 7. Peter provides a list of virtues which interestingly contain virtues also found in so-called Hellenistic moral, the Hellenistic moral philosophy, philosophy of the day. Lists of virtues that encourage people to live a good life. 
And so, my friends, there's, you know, amongst other things, we, we're called to live lives that are virtuous even in the eyes of others. We are to be good citizens. I talked about that last week. But what's different about Peter's list is that his entire list is given a Christian orientation. It begins with the term faith and ends with the term love, neither of which are found in Hellenistic virtue lists. They don't talk about faith. They don't talk about love. Peter's list begins with faith because, my friends, as you know, faith is foundational to the Christian life. It's worth noting that according to verse 5 of our text, believers are commanded to add to your faith, not to add faith. It's not something that you need to conjure up. Indeed, according to our, the opening verse of our text, verse 1, Peter writes as follows. He talks about through the righteousness of our God and Savior Jesus Christ, believers have, and I quote, received a faith. A precious faith. We've received it. Yes, my friends, we are called to believe, but that's a gift of God. It's a gift of God. Jesus Christ is our Savior, and through Him we receive this gift of faith. So Peter isn't commanding his readers to work their way to heaven, but rather reminding them that faith provides the foundation. To faith the believer must add, I'm quoting now from our text, verses 5 and following, must add, or as other translations say, they must supply or must supplement uh, the virtue of excellence of character, as one translation puts it. Excellence of character. If you look, for example, at the requirements for pastoral ministry, there's an emphasis on character. The kind of person that you are adds, lends credibility to the message that you preach. Indeed, one, one uh, uh, older theologian said that long after God's people have forgotten your message, they'll remember your character, the kind of person that you are. But my friends, all of us are called to be people of character. All of us. Yes, pastors might be called to exemplify those things, but all of us are called to be people of excellent character. To this virtue, believers are told to add knowledge. We've talked quite a bit about knowledge. It's not just a head knowledge. But my friends, it's a heart knowledge. It's a relational knowledge. Growing in our knowledge and love of Christ. To knowledge adds self-control and perseverance. I hardly need to remind you that we're living in dark days, in, 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 in evil times. Just this past week, in fact, I was chatting to, 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 to Brother Raymond just before the service. You know, there was a, a, a missionary from SIM that came to speak to our students on Friday about human trafficking. Human trafficking. Kids that are being trafficked. We live in dark days. We think of the, the, uh, the presence of, of things on the internet, the you know, pornography, all these kind of things. It's just uh, the temptations are there. The temptations are, are real. We need self-control. And what about perseverance? I don't know you, but I'm sure that there's struggles in your lives. Temptations to throw in the towel. It's too difficult. It's too hard. God, where are you? What's going on? Well, he says we've got to add these things to our faith, self-control and perseverance. Understanding, my friends, at the end of the day that it's God's power at work in doing these things. God in work in us that produces these things. We must supplement these qualities with godliness. Sometimes we think that godliness simply means you must be godlike. But as one writer rightly says, what it means is that there needs to be a reverence for God in our lives. An obvious Godwoodness in the way we go about our lives. Something distinctively different about the way you go through life and the way an unbeliever does. A reverence for God. A fear of God. 
Paul concludes by saying that these must be supplemented by mutual affection or brotherly love, as some translations said, and love. Because, my friends, it's not just the vertical, but also the human horizontal relationships that are important. Our, the, the danger, the danger given the, the world in which we live is to withdraw, withdraw from, from society, withdraw from the world, because it's evil out there. And yes, we need to be wise and we need to be careful, but remember, Jesus calls us to be salt and light. To have a presence out there that people can see that they might glorify God on the day that he, he, he visits us. We are commanded, my friends, to love both God and neighbor. Well, these are the things, these are the things that we are to add to our faith. Neglecting any of these virtues will hinder spiritual growth. Neglecting God's provision of power will likewise hinder with spiritual growth. Both God's provision of power and his program of growth are quite important. That's why Paul, Peter, outlines them here for us. These qualities, not surprisingly, are in stark contrast to the morality or the immorality of the false teachers that Peter describes in Second Peter chapter 2. Clearly, my friends, there's more to the Christian life than just being saved and going to heaven. God wants you to prepare for glory. He wants your, he wants your eternal home of righteousness to be a good fit. Uh, that you will be happy there and content. Thirdly and finally, Peter commends spiritual growth. In verses 8 through 11. Uh, Peter points out that this spiritual growth, this growing in godliness, brings with it a number of significant blessings. Uh, we will see that believers are called to be mindful of both the present and the future, both of this present life and the life to come. You know, if God had just wanted to save us from this earth, he would have whisked us off to heaven when we believe, but he's left us here, hasn't he? To be witnesses to him and to... To, uh, to testify to the gospel. In verse 8, Peter begins by pointing out that if you possess these qualities in increasing measure, you will be effective and fruitful or productive in your knowledge of Jesus Christ. There's that word again. Effective and fruitful and productive. Isn't that your desire? Peter is concerned not just that believers possess these virtues, but that they are growing in them. Growing in them. This is not a, 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 a once for all activity. It's a daily thing that we do. Nurturing our spiritual life. Paying attention to our spiritual life. This idea of growing means that progress, not perfection, is expected this side of eternity. I've, I've had the privilege of teaching the Bible now for nearly 30 years. I'm still learning, I'm still making mistakes, I'm still growing. By God's grace, I've been a Christian for nearly 50 years, you know. As I said to someone, you'd expect I'm walking on water at this stage. <laughs> I should be, but it's... <laughs> I think some of, my, some of the students wonder if, in fact, I'm regenerate when I'm a Christian. <laughs> well, we joke about these things, but we never stop. We never stop, do we, Gra uh, Raymond? We never stop growing. We... we Continually conscious, not so. See, our walk with God, my friends, is something that we need to give attention to on a daily basis. Look with me at verse 9. Conversely, those who lack these virtues are described as being blind, short-sighted, and forgetful of their cleansing from past sins. There's no indication now that, that, that Peter is talking necessarily about unbelievers. I think what he's saying, it's possible for you to know God and to, to be guilty of spiritual stagnation, short-sighted. You've forgotten that you've been cleansed from your sins. You've forgotten the gospel. That's why he says in verse 12 of our text, he says, Peter says, I, let me just read the actual verses there where he says, 
So he says, I will always remind you of these things he's been talking about, even though you know them and are firmly established in the truth you now have. And it's possible to, to, to stagnate. If you look, for example, at the letters to the seven churches of Revelation, there, there, are, there are churches that are guilty of complacency, compromise. Uh, we are rich, we don't need a thing. He says, you don't realize that you, you're spiritually impoverished and spiritually dead. So Peter commands believers in verses 10 and 11 to make every effort. There's that, it's a different word to verse 5, but it's this idea of being, of being zealous, of having zeal to practice these virtues. There, but I quote, confirming your calling and election. As you pursue these things, you confirm your calling and election. And if you do these things, says Peter, you will never stumble. That word, that construction in the Greek is what we call a double negative. It's the strongest form of negation in the Greek language. It's this kind of idea, you will never, no, never. You will certainly not. There's no ways that you will stumble. Of course, it doesn't mean that you will never stumble in sin, but I think what he means, my friends, is that you will remain steadfast in the faith. And you will receive a rich welcome into Christ's eternal kingdom. And what a day of rejoicing that will be. A rich welcome. <laughs> Enter herein, good and faithful. One commenter paints the picture of a victorious marathon runner being welcomed to the finishing tape by a delighted home crowd, cheering you on. What a wonderful picture. Peter here, when he talks about spiritual growth, there's no promise of an easy or comfortable life, which is so often what we want. But he promises that it will end well. Well, let me make some concluding comments. The good news is that, that God has not left us to our own devices when it comes to the spiritual growth. We provided with God's power, God's magnificent promises, and a very clear program, all of which should encourage us to make the necessary effort to grow in godliness and in so doing, to make our calling and election sure. One writer says this, this moral effort, this pursuit of spiritual growth does not make one elect, rather it demonstrates that one is elect. I know from experience, not personal, but from interacting with others, that it's possible to be, to have saving faith and to lack that assurance. It's possible. There are people that always struggle with that knowledge. It's also very clear that the, the New Testament teaches that it's possible to have that assurance. And one of the ways in which you make your calling and election sure, which are acts of God, is, is by evidencing a day-to-day -day, uh, attention to your spiritual life, seeking to nurture it, spending time uh, reading God's Word, spending time in prayer. But I think it is fair to say that if your spiritual life is not characterized by spiritual growth, you can't have confidence that you will be richly welcomed into God's eternal life. There is this concept of nominalism in the Christian life. People that call themselves Christians, but there's no knowledge of God. There's no relationship. There's no growth. Perhaps this morning I'm speaking to someone like this. But it's important to note that your spiritual journey doesn't begin by making that every effort. But it begins with that step of faith, putting your trust in the person and work of Jesus Christ, thereby coming to truly know Him. 
But your relationship with God doesn't end there. See, my friends, if you want it to be effective, if you want it to be productive, if you want it to end well, if you want that rich welcome, um, we cannot leave. We need to add to that faith. One writer summarizes Peter's teaching in our text as follows. You need a faith that knows, a faith that grows, and a faith that shows. A faith that truly knows Christ. A faith that grows in godliness and shows in virtuous living. That, my friends, according to Peter, is the fruit of a true saving faith. A faith, a spiritual journey that ends well. Let's pray. Father, thank you for our time this morning. Thank you for this reminder from your word um, that you've given us everything we need. Lord, we without excuse. Forgive us when we become complacent, when we compromise, when we forget your magnificent promises, when we live for the things that pass away, not for the things that really matter and the things that last. Thank you again, Lord, that you've not left us to our own devices. So fill us with your spirit, we pray, with that divine power. Uh, help us to be mindful of our glorious destiny, a day that is coming, Lord, when we will enter that new heavens and that new earth, the home of righteousness, for all eternity, where we can enjoy and see you face to face. And we pray this for your name's sake. Amen.